you very much, David, for inviting me back. There aren't that many places that do that. Just over, uh, just over 100 years ago, Hilary Belloc published one of his most ambitious little books, the written-up versions of a brief series of lectures he'd given under the title Europe and the Faith. The thesis of the book was encapsulated in a brief chiasmus, the faith is Europe. Europe is the faith. Now this uh, was subsequently often mistaken for a piece of bombastic European triumphalism, confining the Catholic Church, as it were, to the cultural tradition of Europe. It would be hard work to acquit Belloc. Not a claim about Catholicism. It was a claim about Europe. It was, in essence, the same claim as has recently been advanced at far greater length by Tom Holland in his uh, rather bigger book, Dominion. One of the, probably one of the hundred best books called Dominion. The, the, it's not an original title. The, the claim is that Christianity was the defining force in shaping European culture. The Christian religion. Now, Belloc, of course, rather like a Catholic version of Henry Fielding's uh, Mr. Thwackham, might well have said, when I mention religion, I mean the Christian religion, and not only the Christian religion, but the Catholic religion, and not only the Catholic religion, but the Roman Catholic Church. Tom Holland, though, is not, uh, like Belloc, a Catholic himself, nor indeed a Christian. He's simply an enviably widely read historian with a broad and sympathetic view of the past. And the Christian rooting of European culture is indeed a broad historical reality. However much contemporary Europe may apparently uh, seem or prefer to ignore or repudiate it. Now it's hardly feasible for me to attempt in a single lecture what Belloc did in a short book what Christopher Dawson did in a medium-sized book, The Making of Europe, and what Tom Holland has done in a rather large book. I, I want to make instead three points, somewhat arbitrarily chosen, perhaps. The first is simply to reiterate that this cultural entity that we know as Europe, which has variously expanded and contracted over the centuries, grew out of Christian and indeed Catholic soil. Secondly, that despite the deep and at times bitter division within European culture resulting from the Reformation, Protestant religion was sufficiently close to Catholic for social and cultural coexistence of kinds, and even ultimately flourishing, to remain possible. Now, some anthropologists suggest that culture is fundamentally about kinship. Kinship, that is, not kingship. And one could therefore propose that the Christian doctrine, the Christian practice, the Christian custom of lifelong monogamy with divorce either a non-starter or at most a rare concession, and with a moral equality between freely consenting partners, albeit until very recently within a highly patriarchal framework, one might argue that this has been the backbone of European society for a millennium or more. Until very recently, this doctrinal consensus, if you like, theoretical consensus, and its accompanying ethic of sexual restraint and fidelity, broadly held in both Catholic and Protestant Europe, very solidly in principle, though of course rather less solidly in practice. But my third point is that while Christian Europe has faced many challenges in its past, only in the last two generations has it looked like succumbing to the fate that has overtaken so many cultures in the past of a kind of evaporation. The measures of this massive cultural shift are the decline of adherence to traditional Christian rituals and rites of passage and the complete reshaping of sexual and matrimonial customs. Even if we ignore questions of doctrinal truth and falsehood, the measurement of time and the measurement of human lives, as it were, the marking of time in human lives, is a cultural fundamental 
rites of passage, as the anthropologists call them, today are being redefined as we watch. Baptism, confirmation, marriage and death, the rites of passage of the last millennium, are giving way to baby showers and proms, coming out, transitioning, housewarming, breaking up, and that most terrifying of euphemisms, assisted dying of a peace with the waning of Christian rituals for social rites of passage is the exclusion of terms such as Christmas and Easter from polite vocabulary and the replacement of BC and AD with that curious coinage, common era, as though it were a universal era when it is obviously only a Christian one. As Pope Francis remarked 10 years ago with unusual insight, we are living not in an era of change, but a change of era. And one wonders indeed whether our culture in freeing itself from its Christian inheritance might need to consider a literal change of era for itself. Measuring time from the birth of Christ is not a natural thing. It was attempted only from the early sixth century by Dionysius Exiguus, an Eastern monk who settled at Rome, and it took several centuries for his new system to become normative for a Europe which until then, of course, had dated itself from the foundation of Rome or by the number of the Olympiads. The Venerable Bede, who, like Dionysius, was pretty much obsessed with how you work out the date of Easter, deployed Dionysius' system in his history of the English church and people, and thanks to the influence on Europe of Anglo-Saxon Christianity, this custom of dating had become general by the end of what was, by then, of the first millennium. But it's not essential to Christianity, after all, to mark time this way, let alone to Europe or to the world. To assert that the roots of European culture are Christian would hardly require argument, except for the amnesia which is overwhelming our time. And the easiest way to support the argument is to consider the alternative theory. I think there's only one, which is that European culture is rooted in ancient Greece and Rome. Now, of course, there's a great deal of truth in this. But this alternative theory, which has been especially influential since Jules Michelet and Jacob Burckhardt invented the Renaissance in the mid 19th century, this, you know, there's a lot of truth in this alternative theory. But let's have a look at it. The cultural epoch which we still, following Burkhardt and Michelet, call the Renaissance, did indeed imagine itself as retrieving and refurbishing the legacy of ancient Greece and Rome. But the Renaissance vision of the ancient world was a Christian vision. All Renaissance humanists were Christian humanists. What G.K. Chesterton once said of Renaissance artists actually holds for the Renaissance as a whole. They paraded before the world, he wrote, a wild hypothetical pageant of what old Greece and Rome would have been if they hadn't been pagan. The scholars of the Renaissance in seeking to revive that cultural inheritance of ancient Rome, were striving after a goal that had been sought for centuries. Retrieving the classical past was a medieval invention. They just weren't very good at it. What the Renaissance humanists harked back to was not, as it were, the pagan empire, but the Christian empire of the fourth century. For them, as for Eusebius, the Roman empire had attained its destiny in the Constantinian dynasty, only to crumble away for inscrutable providential reasons, as Augustine of Hippo later rationalized the fall of Rome. But the dream of retrieving Rome was dreamed from 800 to 1600. It was abandoned only when, towards the end of the 17th century, European scholars and thinkers were finally able to imagine that their culture had in many respects, surpassed the achievements of their Roman and Greek forebears. Properly to understand the Renaissance rediscovery of antiquity, 
I'll just give you one detail. From their study of ancient manuscripts, Renaissance humanists were convinced that they had recovered the handwriting of the Romans themselves. And it became the basis of Roman type and the italic hand. What they'd actually found was the handwriting practiced in Christian monasteries in the 9th and 10th centuries. Virtually all the earliest manuscripts we have of classical Latin texts were the products of a monastic scriptorium. It was Christian monks who salvaged what they could from the wreck of the Roman world and passed it on to posterity. So yes, we have our roots in ancient Greece and Rome also, but those roots run through the soil of the church. Whoops. Now there are so many elements in modern European culture that derive from a Christian matrix. Tom Holland's book is absolutely stuffed with them. It would be impossible to list them all here. So I'm just going to note two or three of them, perhaps less familiar, in passing, and then focus on one or two. Linear time. Sorry to get a bit philosophical, and I'm not a philosopher. Linear time, the idea that there's an arrow in time moving inexorably from the past to the future, rather than just circling endlessly round, as Plato thought. We owe that to Christian antiquity, and in particular to Augustine of Hippo. The valuing, the valorization of the poor and the weak Blessed are the poor. He has filled the poor with good things and sent the rich away empty. The heritage of almsgiving and charity still with us that is derived from that. You know, it still resonates in socialism even and in the welfare state. This is a, a big part of our culture. Martyrdom. Blessed are those who suffer persecution for righteousness' sake. The blood of the martyrs is the seed of the church. Martyrs were being honoured in Hellenistic Judaism, the martyrs of the Maccabees. But martyrdom and martyrology reached their maturity in the early church and have become since a potent force throughout Christian, European and now all modern culture. The idea that a cause gains credibility from the willingness of its adherents not to kill for it, but to suffer for it, even to die for it, remains a potent idea when we see all around us. It's long expa expanded beyond the boundaries of Christianity itself. But it would hardly have made sense, would it, to a devotee of Aphrodite or Mithras or Wotan. But two features I'm going to pick out for particular attention today, two features of medieval Christian culture, when the word medieval serves so often as a code for extreme violence, the first is the doctrine of marital consent, essentially the creation of medieval theologians and canon lawyers. Christianity had fought a long and never entirely successful campaign against the sexual double standard that was the norm in the Hellenistic world in which the faith was born. Jesus is doodling in the sand, his invitation to let the man who was without sin cast the first stone for a rather trenchant commentary on the culture that had brought out the woman caught in adultery for stoning. Where was the guy? He's not mentioned in the story. Paul's emphasis on the mutuality of marital obligations, even if he saw the man still as the head in that little private corporation, that emphasis on mutuality was something new. And when Paul called out the sinners of Corinth, it was the young man, I would go to the rest, who headed the list. It was men who were upbraided with the sins of the flesh. This was a new ethic. And although marriage by arrangement, of course, remained the norm for centuries, marriage by the ninth century had come to be recognized as a sacrament by the church, and by the 12th century, Christian thinkers were clear that what made a marriage was the true and free consent of the contracting parties, not the will of their families. And that went for the woman as much as for the man. Consent, of course, has only become more and more important in Western culture as the centuries have gone on. And the notion of the validity, the notion of consent itself has become more subtle with awareness of psychological pressure, the manipulation of the vulnerable, and all the rest. But this fundamental emphasis on the need for consent is the fruit of a long tradition of canonical, theological, and ethical reflection in the Christian tradition. 
My other test case for the legacy of medieval Catholicism is the idea of conscience. Now, the idea of conscience as the inner sanctuary, as it were, of the person, the temple of God's presence, or for atheists, at least the inviolable core of privacy and personality. This was constructed by means I do not know, which scholars whom I have not read, but whose works I've seen the titles of, have anatomized. It was constructed in the centuries of the high and the late Middle Ages. By the time of Martin Luther and Thomas More, <coughs> pardon me, the doctrine was well fixed, thanks in large part to the Sorbonne academic Jean Giasson, who had written about almost everything in the early 15th century, and in particular about that. When Luther took his famous stand at the Reichstag in Worms in 1521, his justification was the word of God, the Bible. But he was following the suggestion explicitly of a 15th century canon lawyer, Niccolò de Tudeschi, Panormitanus, the guy from Palermo, who had come up with the thesis that a single individual armed with the manifest words of scripture, was entitled in conscience to defy scholars, bishops, cardinals, even the Pope, in defense of clear truth. I can see that text receiving a lot more attention from Catholics over the next few years. When Thomas More, on the other side of the Reformation divide, stated in the Tower of London that he would leave every man to his own conscience. If only every man would leave me to mine, he was taking a similar stand, though he justified himself not in terms of the alleged self-explanatory text of scripture, but in terms of the general consensus of the church. But that language of conscience was perfectly well understood by all and sundry in 16th century Europe. When George Crofts was executed in 1538 or 1539 for having uh, offended against Henry VIII's religious settlement in some way. He explained in one of his interrogations, nothing I ever did in all my life, he said, so pained my conscience as when I swore the oath to the king as supreme head of the church. People knew what conscience was. So this idea that we have today about the conscience comes to us from the medieval church. Having thus, with <coughs> notable cunning, brought the discussion round to my own special subject, the Reformation, I can hardly proceed without emphasising one crucial element in modernity which is more traceable to the Protestant than to the Catholic tradition. Individualism, not perhaps an unmixed blessing. The notion that it is for each individual to construct, to chart their path in life, to construct their own pattern of meaning, maybe to find their own truth. Now, individualism was not the first principle of Protestantism. Martin Luther was as certain as any Catholic that there was only one truth. He merely thought he had a sounder grip on it than the ecclesiastical authorities. I can see that idea gaining a bit of traction now as well. But his attempt <clears throat> to bypass the condemnation issued by the Pope through bypassing human authority entirely in favour of the unmediated, pure word of God in the Bible was always doomed to fall, as his opponents pointed out. The notion that the Bible speaks for itself was and remains very alluring. Somehow one feels it ought to <coughs> Do just that, just as Luther and the other reformers said. Yet in practice, Luther and the other Protestant reformers disagreed even among themselves about just what it was that the Bible said. Within 10 years, against Luther himself, other Protestant reformers had denied the usefulness of religious images, denied the real presence in the Eucharist, denied the validity of baptism for infants, some of them had denied the need to keep the moral law, to observe Sunday. Some of them said we should observe Saturday. Uh, the prohibition on divorce went among some of them. 
The prohibition on monogamy went, among others. <clears throat> the doctrine of the Trinity, of course, <clears throat> did not survive among all, and the doctrine of the Incarnation had been questioned by 1530. And all this on the basis of the same principle, the clear and unmediated word. Now, it's not a place for polemic, but it is a place for me to point out that all of these interpretations rested on the same agreed principle, true saving faith. Uh, only those who had true saving faith could understand the scripture. They were illuminated by the Holy Spirit and the certainty of faith which they had was immediately transparent and accessible to the individual. And of course this creates a perfect circle of consolidation and corroboration. So Luther's principle of spirit-guided personal certainty turned out to be carte blanche for anyone to advance their personal reading of the Bible as the teaching of the Holy Spirit. Now in later Protestant culture, this would be affirmed positively as the principle of the private interpretation of scripture. A classic example, as the computer people say today, of how the bug becomes a feature. But the line from there to our own individualistic society is arrow straight. Now as perhaps that example indicates, not all the features of Christian European culture are good or healthy. I'll turn, therefore, to the most egregiously ugly feature. What can one say about anti-Semitism and the blood libel? We can say now, very easily, that anti-Semitism is evidently as incompatible with Christian charity as slavery. But neither of those truths was self-evident to our predecessors. And sadly, it's also important to note that in the case of anti-Semitism, at least, the cultural division of the Reformation did almost nothing to change attitudes here. Some of you may have, you've all heard of Martin Luther. Some of you may have heard of his great Catholic opponent, John Eck. Now, Martin Luther very famously wrote uh, an excoriating attack on Jews in the early 1540s. What not many people know is that his Catholic opponent, John Eck, did exactly the same thing at almost exactly the same time. So they might have disagreed on a lot, but they agreed on that. Now, only one of the minor Protestant reformers actually pointed out, also around about 1540, that uh, the blood libel was obviously nonsense, because anybody who actually knew anything about Jews knew what a, as it were, you know, taboo blood was for them, that the whole idea of the blood libel was utterly incompatible with Jewish way of life. Now it's difficult for Christians, and I think in particular for Catholics, properly to face up to the evil that is anti-Semitism, which has been so pervasive for the last millennium, and has only really been generally repudiated in Christian culture, I would say looking around, within our lifetime. And that largely because of the horrors perpetrated by the Nazis. And it won't really quite do to launder a bloody history by drawing complacent distinctions between modern anti-Semitism and an older anti-Judaism. Nazi genocide, though entirely racist in ideology, could not have gained the traction it gained had not the cultural ground been very well prepared by notions of collective guilt and the blood libel and by the marginalization of Jews in Christian society or their expulsion from it. So the religious anti-Judaism of the Middle Ages you know, was already being racialized, as they say today, by the 16th century. The blood libel, which originated in England, that won't be as unpopular a thing to say here perhaps as it would be in England, but the blood libel which originated in England in the 12th century still circulates to this day. And if you actually ever do care to go into that horrible subject, you will see that it betrays in every detail that it's the product of a Christian imagination. And we can't wish all this away, however much we might properly condemn it in accordance with the Second Vatican Council, I would add. And I emphasize this because when people like me stand up and talk about Europe and the faith, it's very easy to slip into a self-regarding and self-congratulatory nostalgia, as though, if only we were all Christians, all would be well. 
Once upon a time, we were all Christians, and all was not well. G.K. Chesterton once said in another of his many, many brilliant remarks, the Christian ideal has not been found wanting, it's been found difficult and left untried. We might update that a little. Christianity has been tried. Christians have been found wanting. But that brings us back to perhaps one of the most evident debts of modernity to the Christian tradition, and that is self-criticism. As though, although the horrors of anti-Semitism make it all too clear, European societies, like all human societies, have been prone to blame misfortune and disaster upon others, or the other, as people often call it today. And Jews were, of course, the other, the first other for Christians. But European culture has been at least as prone to blame misfortune and disaster upon itself. A rather less widespread trait. And this tradition remained as strong in Protestant culture as in Catholic. It's as evident in 19th century evangelicalism as it is in contemporary Catholicism. This urge to self-criticism derives very obviously from the prophetic tradition of the Old Testament, of the Hebrew Scriptures, with their conception of sin and covenant and breaking the covenant. Like, like the Jews of the Old Testament, Christians have sought remedy for misfortune and disaster in appeasing God, not simply through ritual performance, but also through repentance, a change of heart, a change of being, a change of behaviour. Modern Europe and the modern West may be rapidly losing the traditional Catholic sense of sin, but it's reinventing it in numerous other ways, in understandable anxieties about environmental damage, in more complex and contested concerns about complicity, in various forms of oppression, perceived, alleged, or real, most notably, of course, slavery and racism, and also in relation to aspects of personal identity. The availability of forgiveness and the anatomy of sinfulness are highly inconsistent in many of these modern variations. Some offences of people are unforgivable, others easily so, but no theology of forgiveness, no doctrine of forgiveness is there, merely an unpredictable upwards or downwards thumb from the crude instrument of judgment that I call antisocial media. To turn thoroughly to the present, though, we need to face up to the seismic cultural change through which we are living, and that cultural change is evident if we look around the audience. It's a change that is often, and to my mind, slightly mistakenly called secularization. But we all know what I mean when I say that. I don't like that term, secularization, and I shall explain why. Secularization really is the separation of church and state. And there's an increasing body of historical scholarship which I think rightly sees that as a Christian thing. And this might seem curious. Ultimately, it is arguable, the separation of church and state is necessitated by the Catholic Church's internal dynamics, specifically by its aspiration to liberty and autonomy. Autonomy is necessary for a Christian church because the alternative, as we see with the Church of England, is controlled by the state and subservience to it. But the price of ecclesiastical liberty is, in fact, freedom of religion. And the price of religious freedom is ecclesiastical liberty. Now, these are both hard doctrines to grasp, and it's taken us a long, long time to get to where we are today, where I think we can see them clearly. When the Christian church first secured its liberty back in imperial Rome, the inherent logic of the first proposition was not apprehended. It was a millennium. It was not until after the Reformation that the process began which laid bare this logic. Likewise, when the French Revolution, for it was that first unleashed freedom of religion on the world in 1790, the logic of the second proposition, that that required the independence of churches, was equally opaque, even to the revolutionaries. No sooner had they declared freedom of religion than they passed the civil constitution of the clergy, endeavouring to have their cake 
and eat it, uh, trying to make all Catholic priests sworn, obedient functionaries of the state, elected by the people. Utterly inconsistent with freedom of religion. Over the next two centuries, the logic of religious liberty has been worked out, most preeminently, I think, in the American tradition, seen, as it were, preeminently in two documents, the United Nations Declaration on Human Rights and within the Church in the Vatican Council's Decree on Human Dignity from 1965. But it has to be said that the Church itself has been painfully slow to learn the logic of the Gospel in this regard. The hankering after worldly power and social status is a hard habit to kick. Anyway, what's going on in European culture, I propose, is not secularization. I see dangerous signs of that being reversed. What's going on is de-Christianization. So let's call it what it is. De-Christianization, the mass desertion of European peoples from the ecclesiastical loyalties and practices of their ancestors and from the moral consensus that bound most Christian churches together until the last two or three generations. And that made, for example, although Protestant and Catholic, to speak crudely, were so opposed to each other, there has always been conversion, assimilation, transfer from one side to the other, because it's still actually relatively simple to do that within that whole worldview. Now, the abandonment of the moral consensus of Christianity has in turn first meant the marginalization and now threatens the exclusion of Christian belief and commitment from politics and the public square. And this accompanies a massive misapprehension about de-Christianization, which is that de-Christianization means an abandonment of religion. Now this misapprehension is quite easy to fall into because most of the people who abandoned Christianity within the last two or three generations have abandoned it for almost nothing in particular, often hardly even consciously. Uh, have abandoned it for atheism perhaps, or agnosticism, or simply for indifference, for forms of life which do not revolve around or acknowledge the existence of God or gods of any kind. Now, the point is that the concept of religion, as I think, which is a relatively novel concept, the Romans had the word religio, but it didn't mean anything like what we mean by religion then. And medieval Europe had the word religio, but that meant belonging to a religious order. So religions, as we now understand them, that concept of religion first starts to be conceptualized in the context of the Reformation itself in the 16th and 17th centuries because it comes, becomes necessary to have a word to sort of describe what Catholicism and Protestantism are and other things, you know, because they're, they're clearly very similar and very related, but they're obviously not the same. And the word religion comes to fill that gap. But it expands. As the concept of religion was first developed in early modern Europe, amid this religious division between Catholics and Protestants, it was, for a long time, obviously closely related to belief in God or gods. It began to be expanded, first obviously to Islam and Judaism, then to systems of belief beyond that, in the late 18th and 19th centuries to Hinduism, in the 19th century to Buddhism. But once we get out to Hinduism and then to Buddhism, we're dealing with things which are, as it were, kind of obviously religions, but, you know, by the time we get to Buddhism, well, well where's God in that? Or gods? It, it doesn't get so clear. Uh, so the concept of religion was closely associated with belief in gods, or God. But the anthropological or ethnographic approach to religion, which has been pursued since the late 19th century, doesn't, sorry, should warn us against any over-ready identification of religion with God. Following Durkheim, I propose we can define religion as that which is concerned with what is sacred in any given society. In his words, religion is a unified system of beliefs and practices relating to sacred things, 
that is to say, to things set apart and forbidden, beliefs and practices which unite into one single moral community all those who adhere to them. What was perhaps not even obvious to Durkheim, and I'm no expert on Durkheim, so again I'm open to correction, what was perhaps not obvious even to him is now plain to see, which is that a society can have things set apart and forbidden without calling them or associating them with God or gods. It became abundantly clear in the 20th century that the best way to conceptualise some of the more horrific ideologies of the time, preeminently Nazism, but also Marxist-Leninism, Stalinism, Maoism, and the rest, was in Michael Burley's term as political religion. These movements were not simply political movements advancing political goals. They adapted the forms and methods of religious belonging and believing, from catechisms and scriptures to inquisitions and auto da fe and beyond, with rallies and parades as their rituals and their processions, and the party as the one true church. And today, as we see around us, Atheist humanism takes on the form of a religion. What is Richard Dawkins but a religious controversialist along the lines of Robert Bellamine in the 17th century? Just as convinced of his grasp of the truth, though comparing Dawkins and Bellamine, Dawkins is not quite so good as Bellamine at actually understanding the arguments of his opponents. On reflection then, I wonder whether there has ever been or can ever be a human society without some kind of religious commitment, without something that it holds sacred, something beyond question. So in looking towards a post-Christian Europe, we should again bear in mind the words of G.K. Chesterton, who very nearly said, but didn't quite, when people stop believing in God, they don't start believing in nothing, they start believing in anything. The question is not what will Europe be like without religion. The question is what religion might replace Christianity in Europe. And there are two or three obvious candidates for this. The one that might leap most readily to many people's minds would be the most obviously religious, the most obviously God-focused of them, Islam. But it's easy to see why people might think that. It's a monotheistic religion, and monotheism has a good track record. Islam is a noble tradition. It cultivates many virtues. Like Christianity, its virtues are often seen as much in their distortions as in their practice. In demographic terms, Islam has grown in contemporary Europe, rather like Catholicism in Victorian England and Scotland, or or in 19th century America, by migration. Yet apart from small numbers of conversions that follow a pattern familiar in movements within Europe's kinds of Christianity, it doesn't look like spreading much outside its demographic base. So, I'm not inclined to see the candidate here. What else is out there? Well, we could start by asking, in the spirit of Durkheim again, what are the sacred things, the things set apart and forbidden? What are the things we're not allowed to challenge or to question? And the most obvious candidates here at the moment of various ideas and propositions found in discourse relating to race and sex. These ideas and propositions are perhaps what some people mean when they talk about woke, but there's no real consensus on what that word means, nor even on whether it's a term of abuse or a badge of honour. But this complex of ideas and demands definitely has sacred symbols. They're among the most visible and most widely recognised iconography of our times. And while the sacred symbols of Christianity, because they explicitly relate to God, are either formally or at least informally increasingly excluded from public buildings, the sacred symbols of the new thing are increasingly offered for display by public authority as a sign of belonging to the community. It's not a test act. It's not the sort of exclusion Daniel O'Connell had to combat. But when one sees the smattering of employment law cases in which attempts are made to dismiss employees for wearing Christian symbols, 
on the one hand, and the handful of stories on the other about employees or volunteers being reluctant to wear other symbols and being dismissed, then maybe there's the sign of something. I can't tell. Time, as they say, will tell. Are these casual events, passing fashions, or the beginning of a trend? For Christians looking to the future, the crucial question will concern their place in the culture constructed on the basis of whatever new religion might emerge. And this is likely to take some time. Will that religion, like so many before it, demand a measure of allegiance from all those who inhabit its territory? In ancient times, Christians refused to pay divine honours to the Roman emperor, even though the empire required this in principle and from time to time sought to enforce it in practice. Not that often. We shall not be called upon, I'm sure, to offer worship to some god if some new political religion becomes the cultural heart of Europe, because it won't explicitly name any gods. But contemporary political movements are already making heavy ethical demands, in effect requiring allegiance to philosophical principles, even though those principles are not demonstrably based either in reason or in revelation. Will what some people call, well, will secularism in the proper sense, secularism, the acceptance of the incapacity of the state to determine ethical, philosophical or religious questions, will secularism survive the passing of the Christian culture in which it itself developed? I hope so, but I'm not entirely convinced chiefly because of the way that what were until recently considered rights of conscience are already under pressure. For example, the demands at some United Kingdom party conferences to adopt policies that would exclude from employment in the health service any person who would refuse on grounds of conscience to perform or assist in abortions. Now, to exclude committed Christians from working for such a major employer would be little more than vindictiveness in itself, because there are plenty of other jobs you can do in the health service. But the point wouldn't be to improve the health service. It would be to inform Christians and others who is in charge. The non-theological candidates for the role of Europe's new religion all revolve around concepts of human rights. But one of the vulnerabilities of the doctrine of human rights is that it depends so very heavily on presuppositions about what is or who is human. It might be thought that this is at least open to empirical observation and verification, but contemporary discourse relating to sex and what some people conceptualize as gender has shown that what one generation sees as empirically obvious can be open to question or even flatly denied by the next. And to take a an example that's over and done. Two or three generations ago, European societies regarded the lives of the unborn as human lives, deserving of the protection of the law. Even though the existence of laws against abortion, of course, demonstrated that there were women who wished, often desperately and at great risk to themselves, to terminate their pregnancies. But by a sort of ethical dialectic that went from medical interventions to save lives to something now called reproductive health, we see a situation in which the unborn are implicitly excluded from the set of human lives. It's a distinct shift. And of course, if you're not a human life, you're not open to the protection of human laws, or, and you don't have human rights. The unborn may be empirically human. It's hard to see what other species they might be assigned to. They may be genetically distinct beings. They may be living but they don't currently seem to be deemed by the law to be in every sense living human beings. Certainly not in Britain, anyway. So redefinitions of apparently robust and solid concepts are very much on the agenda and seem to be becoming more frequent. It would take a bit of a gambler, I think, to bet on which of our current definitions today will stand in 10 or 20 years' time. Now, vague prognostications like that are, of course, just thin end of the wedgery, we all know, but, but quite a few wedges have been driven in fairly deep over the last generation or two, usually in line with predictions. Now, I'm a historian. The future is not my period. 
So what lies ahead for Europe, notwithstanding the blurb for this talk, I cannot possibly say. Europe's place in the world will depend, as far as one can presently tell, on its economic welfare, its success in coping with climate change, and its capacity to defend itself against its enemies. Whether it can manage these things without the Christian culture that's sustained it over the past millennium is another question. If it can, I think it will need to do so with the aid of some other religion, most probably some version of human rights doctrine. But the culture that might be forged by such a protean and manipulable doctrine is likely to be a very different thing from the culture of the past thousand years or even the culture of the past couple of hundred years, not least because doctrine now changes with such dizzying rapidity. Europe will remain much as it is perhaps as a geographical expression, but as a cultural expression, it looks like meaning something very different. Now, uncertainty about the future of European culture and amnesia about the Christian past of that culture are both symptoms of that change of era to which Pope Francis alluded 10 years ago. It first became unmistakably evident, to my mind, in the celebrations of the millennium, about 23 years ago. In Britain, as in most of Europe, the person whose second millennium was being specifically celebrated was conspicuous chiefly by his absence from the celebrations. Jesus was mentioned in Christian contexts around 2000, but the Christian context was no longer the context in which the culture as a whole was happy to locate itself. The decisive year, though, I think as a historian I can identify, it was 2004, which saw both the deliberate exclusion of any mention of Christianity from the Constitution of the European Union, and that was quite a controversial argument about that, you'll remember. And secondly, it saw the Rocco Butiglione, affair, the personal exclusion of an extremely well-qualified candidate for the office, from the office of uh, EU Commissioner for Justice on the explicit grounds of his Christian beliefs. And the subsequent jettisoning of the Christian doctrine of marriage, it was his beliefs about marriage, etc., that were in question. The subsequent jettisoning since 2004 of the understanding of marriage which had prevailed in Europe for the previous thousand years constitutes, I suggest, a definitive break with Europe's Christian past. This is evident, in Britain at least, by the difficulty with which any Christian now faces if they seek elected public office and are not prepared publicly to renounce the Christian doctrine of marriage on a personal as well as a public level as a condition of election. It will be interesting to see what happens with one of the candidates for the leadership of the Scottish National Party in that regard. And that's not to mention the increasing pressure, and in many cases successful pressure, on Christian churches as a whole to change their doctrines in, a com in accordance with modern conventions and legislation. One can hardly predict the future, as I've said before, but one can say, as a general rule, that a massive change in the understanding and structure of marriage and the family and the rest is in itself an epochal cultural shift. It's not the herald of one, it is one. And it's this profound shift which consolidates and even perhaps necessitates for our contemporaries the repudiation of the Christian past. But can Europe retain any significant connection with its past if it cuts itself off from and excludes Christianity as incompatible with its new religious commitments. I call them religious, not secular. As Tom Holland has emphasized, rightly in his recent book, crucial elements in contemporary religious commitments, <coughs> even those which people call woke, remain evidently rooted, rooted in that Christian history, that Christian past, that Christian worldview. But if these commitments are detached from that Christian past and that Christian literature and that Christian culture, as they are increasingly being, will they in fact remain tenable 
Will they remain credible? Will they be sustainable? Can the branches still blossom and flower and fruit when they are cut off the tree?